Well, good morning and happy new year. Uh, welcome to the first service, or first 10 a.m. service of the new year. Uh, my name is Stephen, uh, if I haven't met you, and it's my joy to serve as part of the team here at Oasis uh, as the youth pastor here. I uh, hope you had uh, a great New Year's. Uh, I, well, mine was prior to New Year's. I went down to Sydney and visited uh, family and got to meet uh, my cute little three-month-old nephew for the first time. Uh, so I had uh, a good little bit of a break. Uh, but it's nice to be back and to be uh, gathered with you today. This week, we're continuing our series, How We Change. Uh, and this morning's sermon is titled, Change is Heart Work. Our Bible reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your Bible or your phone with you, could I invite you to turn to uh, the book of Luke, chapter 6, and we're reading verses 43 to 45. The verses will also be up on the screen. So Luke chapter 6 from verse 43. These are words that Jesus uh, is saying, and he says this. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. This is the word of the Lord. Kids, those of you who are here, do you know what a New Year's resolution is? A few thumbs up. Uh, Nods of heads, that's good. Uh, Hands up, anyone, if you've made uh, New Year's resolutions before. Yeah, a few hands are up. Perhaps you've made some the past couple weeks. Maybe you've made some uh, in years previous. Have you ever stopped to wonder why we make New Year's resolutions? What is their purpose? Now, I didn't grow up making New Year's resolutions, and the people around me didn't seem uh, to do that either, and so I kind of had to consult the internet and my friend Wikipedia to help me understand, or just even help provide a uh, a definition of what a New Year's resolution is, and this is what Wikipedia said. A New Year's resolution is a tradition in which a person resolves to continue good practices, change an undesired trait or behavior, accomplish a personal goal, or otherwise improve their behavior at the beginning of a calendar year. Now, for some people, New Year's resolutions might look something like deciding to eat more healthily during the year. Maybe it's to start running or get more healthy and exercise more. Maybe it's to spend less time on devices and more time with family and friends. People want to change their lives because they realize that who they are is not who they want to be. If we think about the Bible reading this morning, we might say it like this, our lives are not producing the fruit we want to see, so we have to change to produce different fruit, better fruit, good fruit. But what is it that we need to change? Is it something external to us, something maybe like a behavior or a habit? Or is there something deeper, something within us that actually needs to change in order to produce lasting fruit? something like an attitude or a mindset. And and why are we never satisfied? Why is there always more that could change? Why do we get to the end of a year and think, hey, I'd really like to change this again or change this in the new year? Well, in Luke 6, Jesus tells us that the issue ultimately lies with what is inside of us, specifically what is in our hearts. In the 16th century, an English reformer by the name of John Bradford is credited with coining this phrase when he saw a criminal being led away to be executed. 
He's claimed to have said, there but for the grace of God go I. Bradford knew that the very same evil that had led the criminal to commit the crime that had led to his execution existed within his own heart. And his statement is an expression of humility. It's an expression of reliance on God's grace rather than his own morality. Could the same also be true for you and I? Does the same evil that resides in the heart of a condemned criminal lurk in my heart, in your heart? To produce good fruit, change needs to happen internally. Change is heart work. Therefore, if we truly want to change and produce good fruit, then there are three things that we need to recognize. Firstly, we need to recognize our depravity. Second, we need to recognize that God alone is good. And third, we need to recognize our complete dependence on God if we want to share in his goodness. So firstly, we need to recognize our own depravity. Kids, do you know what that word means? The word depravity, adults, do you know what the word depravity means? In short, it means wickedness or evil. So in other words, I'm saying that we need to recognize that we are inherently evil, that we are bent towards evil. This is just what you wanted to hear on the first Sunday of a new year, right? But don't switch off, stick with me and let me explain a bit. In the parable of the fruit and uh, of the tree and its fruit, Jesus tells us that the type of tree is what defines the type of fruit it produces. If I wanted to go and find some grapes, would I find grapes growing on a mango tree? Would I find grapes growing on a cactus plant? The answer is no then where do I go to find grapes apart from the local supermarket? We find grapes growing on a grapevine. We find figs growing on a fig tree. We find apples growing on an apple tree. You get the point, right? The type of tree determines the type of fruit it produces. And Jesus says that it is the same with people. But instead of the multiple different types of fruit trees that are out there, Jesus puts people into just two categories, good and evil. Good people produce good fruit, and evil people produce bad or evil fruit. So this then leads to the question, well, what kind of tree or what kind of person are you? Are you good or are you evil? What do you want to be? You see, it's more than just about whether we do good or do evil because ultimately what we do is defined by who we are. In Luke chapter 6, in verse 45, Jesus says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Your heart is central to who you are. I'm not talking about the muscle in our body that's called the heart. I'm talking about what an organization called Compelling Truth defines as the place where emotions and desires begin. It is that which drives the will towards action. The heart of man, as described in the Bible, is primarily a spiritual organ that drives man's behavior. Pastor and author Timothy Keller writes, Every heart has an inclination, something it is directed toward. The direction of the heart then controls everything. 
our thinking, our feeling, our decisions and actions. What we most love, we find reasonable, desirable and doable. Whatever we cherish in our hearts most controls the whole person. If that is the case, then what is it that you cherish the most? If we're truly honest with ourselves, despite our desire to do good, we ought to recognize that our hearts naturally favor evil. What would we see if played up on a big screen in public, we saw every thought that ever crossed through your mind, however quickly? What would we see if we saw every desire of your heart get played on a big screen in public? Be rather scary, at least from what I know goes on in my head. I think we'd soon see that each of us, deep down, is evil. We may not see that play out around us all the time. Most of us have developed filters through which we process our deepest and our darkest thoughts so that we don't necessarily speak or act on those impulses. But they're still there deep down inside of us. And occasionally, late at night perhaps, maybe after a couple of drinks or at other times when our filters are not working so well, What we're thinking and what we're feeling actually does pop out and reveal itself to those around us. Now, this might be seen as as being highly entertaining uh, at times when someone says or does something seemingly out of character or inappropriate that's just a bit abrupt. But in reality, this reveals deep down that we are truly evil. The fact that we might even consider inappropriate thoughts and behavior entertaining reveals the extent of our depravity, our wickedness. Now, this might not be something that we like to hear, but it is incredibly important that we do hear it. If that's not enough to convince you, then the very words of the Bible tell us the same. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul writes, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Earlier in that same chapter, Paul quotes various Old Testament scriptures saying, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. In the New Testament, Jesus says, For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Or as the message, a modern paraphrase of the Bible puts it, all these are vomit from the heart. There is the source of your pollution. Oftentimes, these evils can present themselves in disguise. Listen to how pastor and author Paul Tripp describes this problem. He writes, here's the danger for me and for you. Sin doesn't always look sinful to us. It's hard to admit, but sometimes sin actually looks beautiful to us. The man lusting after the woman in the mall or the shopping center doesn't actually see something ugly and dangerous. No, he sees beauty. The guy who is cheating on his taxes doesn't see the moral danger of deception. He sees the excitement of having additional money to satisfy his desires. The woman gossiping on the phone 
doesn't see the destructiveness of what she's doing because she's taken up with the buzz of passing a tail. The child who is rebelling against the will of her parents doesn't see the danger that she's placing herself in because she is captivated by the thrill of her temporary independence. Part of the deceptive power of sin in my heart is its ability to look beautiful when it is actually terribly ugly. Can you see how easily deceived we are into thinking evil really isn't as bad as it is? And then on the other hand, you might be wondering, but can't evil people still do good? Well, the prophet Jeremiah spoke these words that God had given him. Can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Sure, actions might appear to be good, but the motivation behind them oftentimes is still evil. People do good so that others would praise them. They appear to do good because it's what is expected of them. They feel obligated to do good but they're really just driven by pride and self-glory. Friends, it's the first Sunday of the year, and you might have come expecting to hear a sermon that would be uplifting and encouraging, and so far, this probably hasn't been either. But bear with me, things do get better. Sometimes we need to stop and understand just how bad something really is in order for us to better appreciate just how good the good news, which we'll get to in a moment, actually is. But first, we need to hear the truth that our hearts are naturally evil, and therefore we cannot produce good fruit in and of ourselves. If we want to change and produce good fruit, then the first thing we need to recognize is our depravity or our wickedness. Well, the second point, the second thing we need to recognize is that only God is good. The disciple John put it this way in the first of his three letters. He writes, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. How often do we see good and bad portrayed or contrasted as light and darkness? Well, here is the ultimate contrast. Perhaps we could rephrase what John wrote by saying, God is good. In him, there is no wickedness at all. And we see this personified in the person of Jesus. Jesus became God in the flesh In John's gospel, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There are many ways throughout the gospels that we see Jesus display God's goodness. When he was tempted in the wilderness, he didn't give in to Satan's temptations. Jesus responds to those who are poor and needy with compassion and kindness. He responds to the religious leaders mostly with patience and wisdom. He responds to wickedness with righteous anger. And ultimately, we see Jesus lay down his life, though he was innocent, so that we who are guilty might be forgiven and likewise pronounced innocent, not through any work or achievement of our own, but solely through the life, death, and resurrection of the only one who can be called good. That is Jesus, God in the flesh. If we want to change, if we want to become good and produce good fruit, we need to first recognize our depravity And second, we need to recognize that only God is good. And then third, we need to recognize 
our complete dependence on God if we want to share in his goodness. Today's Bible reading speaks of the tree that produces good fruit or evil fruit. And in John's gospel, in John chapter 15, Jesus uses another plant analogy to help us understand this third point. In John 15, Jesus says, I am the way, uh, I am the vine, wrong part of John. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. If, if we want a change to be good and able to produce good fruit, then we need to trust in Jesus. He is the vine, and we are the branches that need to remain connected to him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through Jesus. No one can access the one who is good and who is able to make us good except through Jesus. On the day of Pentecost, the day when the promised Holy Spirit was given to Jesus' disciples and the day that the church was born. In the book of Acts, a crowd has gathered and they've just heard Peter preach a sermon about who Jesus is. Those people then ask Peter and the other disciples, brothers, what shall we do? To which Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a critical piece of the puzzle if we want to change to be good trees that bear good fruit. According to Jesus, the Holy Spirit would be sent by God the Father in the name of the Son to teach us all things and to remind us of everything that Jesus the Son has said. Now you may have noticed that we haven't titled this sermon, Change is Hard Work. We've entitled it, Change is Heart Work. It's not hard work because it's not something that we can ever hope to achieve in our own strength. The change that produces good fruit is heart work and ultimately it is God's work. Paul Tripp paints it quite plainly. He writes, we need help. And God in grace has met us with that help. This help doesn't come to us first in a theology or a set of commands or principles, but it comes to us in a person. God knew that my struggle with sin would be so great that it would not be enough to forgive me. That forgiveness is a wonderful thing, but I need more. So God not only forgives, but he also gets inside me by his spirit. The spirit that now lives inside me is a warrior spirit who, by grace, does battle with my sin, even in moments when I don't care to. His redemptive zeal is unstoppable. Think of Peter, who denied any knowledge of Christ. Was it the end of his story? No, but not because Peter had the sense to pursue Jesus. It was because Jesus, in unrelenting, forgiving grace, pursued Peter. In our battle with sin, are we called to wrestle, run, fight, and pray? Yes, we are. But our hope is not in in our ability to do these things but in the God of grace who will war with sin until sin is no more. 
He never grows tired, never gets frustrated, and never gives up. Now that is hope. The Holy Spirit is the one who will come and transform our hearts. That part within each one of us that drives our behavior, that drives our emotions and desires, that drives our will. And when our heart is shaped by Him, only then can we be good and produce good fruit. What does good fruit look like? The Bible helpfully gives us a list of the fruit that the Spirit produces. It looks like this. Many of you will be familiar with this. It looks like love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the fruit that a good tree produces. These are the fruit that a good person produces not in their own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within them, battling sin and shaping their heart. Church, as we begin a new year and consider possible changes in our lives, would we reflect on the type of fruit that we are producing? Maybe 2024 is the year that you go from being a bad tree that produces bad fruit to becoming a good tree, producing good fruit. Each of us knows the evil that resides inside of us. And maybe you're over trying to battle it on your own. Maybe you're over giving in to the evil. Perhaps this is the year and even the day that you respond to what God has done for you in sending Jesus to die on a cross for our sins and raising him back to life so that we too could be forgiven. Perhaps it's time to respond to the Holy Spirit and invite him to help you battle against the sin in your life. If that's you and you want to talk to someone about it, could I encourage you after the service to head to the prayer corner? Jesse will be in the prayer corner after the service, uh, or you can come down to the front and speak with me. Well, maybe 2024 is the year that you mature and produce an even better harvest than 2023. What would it look like for you this year to grow a greater dependence on God? Perhaps it looks like committing to a Bible reading plan. Maybe that's something you could do with some friends or your spouse, your family. Maybe a greater dependence on God looks like joining a life group. As you consider these things, as you consider what a greater dependence on God might look like, Would you ask the Holy Spirit to teach you, to remind you of all that Jesus has said? Would you ask the Holy Spirit to help you do battle against the evil in your heart? Would you ask the Holy Spirit to grow his fruit in your life, knowing that without him, without Jesus, without God, we would all be left to our own evil desires and their consequences? Change is heart work. Towards the beginning of this sermon, I quoted John Bradford, who said, There but for the grace of God go I. And I followed up with a question Could the same also be true for you and I? Does the same evil that resides in the heart of a condemned criminal also lurk in my heart and in your heart? I believe we've seen that our response should be an overwhelming yes. Apart from the grace of God, apart from the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, we would all share the same fate as that condemned criminal. As we reflect on this, 
May we humble ourselves before God, knowing that to change, that to become a good tree that produces good fruit, we must first recognize that we are evil, that only God is good, and that we can only share in his goodness when we completely depend on him. As we come to a time of prayer, I'm going to give us some space to just reflect. I want to to invite you to reflect on the condition of your heart and on what God might be highlighting for you this morning. After a few moments, I'll then lead us in a closing prayer. But let's take this moment now and come before our Heavenly Father. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the desires and devices of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things that we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health. There is no goodness inside of us. O Lord, have mercy on us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who repent. According to your promises, declare to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. I'd love to invite you to join me in standing if you're able to as I finish with this benediction from the book of 1 Thessalonians. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen.